All right, so tonight we're going to talk again about building a product catalog. Uh, I believe this is the seventh session in this particular series, which is building a mobile app using App Accelerator. So we're going to basically build our a product catalog in a mobile app. And we're going to use a third-party application tool instead of just uh, trying to learn a straight-up iOS or Android. So up till now, we have covered what a product catalog is, how to define it, how to pull out the different elements of it. We've uh, looked at using data files and databases. Uh, we've also built product catalog applications uh, as a standalone application to connect to our database. We built a model view controller, a web application to do some basic product catalog database update CRUD type functionality. And we also built a WordPress admin application last time to interface with our product catalog within a WordPress application. We also talked about using Selenium to test our web applications, and we walked through the uh, Selenium IDE and some base Java unit test functionality with Selenium. Today, though, we are going to kind of start over a little bit. We're going to revisit a particular use case for building a mobile application. This is going to be probably one of three use cases for building a mobile app. This one is focused primarily on just a plain old vanilla CRUD mobile application app. Then later classes will cover uh, connecting our mobile app to a web API and building an actual web API for mobile devices or interacting with uh, third-party applications. We're going to also look at what questions we need to ask ourselves before we build an app. So starting out, you don't want to just jump in and build a mobile application. So we're going to look at the types of questions you need to ask yourself before building an app. We're going to look at App Accelerator. This is just one of many third-party cross-platform tools that you can use to build to write essentially one mobile application, but deploy to multiple platforms similar to Java, the way Java works with its JVM. We're also going to build our first app in App Accelerator. We're going to run down how the code framework works, how the project structure works. It's pretty straightforward, HTML, JavaScript, CSS. And then we're going to actually combine our product catalog into the application we built. So the use case today we're going to look at is a store owner wants to build an online catalog for all their items in their store. However, they don't want to manually sit down at the computer and sit there and type in all the information. They want the application built on a mobile device, such as a phone or a tablet, so that they can just walk around the store, take a picture, type in some information, maybe even have a little functionality where it can scan the barcode and it will pull the information into the app for them. But for this particular feature, we're going to focus primarily on having a mobile app where the user can add or edit or even remove a product from the catalog. So what do we want to build? Well, a simple CRUD application like we have so far. So we're going to have basic five functionality pieces. We're going to add an item, list all the items in the catalog, display, edit, and remove the items from the catalog. In this particular case, we're also going to need to build a database. Within the mobile app functionality, the database we're going to use, or most mobile applications use, is going to be a SQLite database. But before we build the mobile app, what are some of the questions we need to ask ourselves? You know, why are we building this app? Who is the target audience? You know, who exactly is going to be using this app? Is it going to be our employees? Is it going to be our customers? Is it going to be a third-party company? You know, are we going to build this and sell this to other companies? What devices are the customers going to be using? So whoever your target audience is, what devices do they have? You know, if you your customers all use iPhones and iPads, you're not going to want to sit down and write an Android app. It's not going to work for them. However, if they use Android and they if they just have Samsung phones or Google phones, you don't want to write an iOS app. It won't work for them. However, if everyone uses a variety of devices, be it from Windows, iOS, to Android, then you're probably going to want to build an application that works for all those. Which leads to our third question. Do we need to become a master of one particular application framework, or do we need to become a master of many? And we'll get into more of that in just a minute. So first, we want to talk about picking a device. So I briefly mentioned iPhones, iPads, Androids, and Windows. Well, there's multiple devices out there. So we have Apple, which typically runs iOS, or if you have like the iPads or 
you actually are building an app for a desktop, you also need to have Xcode. So for Windows, we have .NET, C Sharp, and other Windows frameworks, but we do have Windows Phone. So typically, a lot of the Windows apps are built with C Sharp. Android is a Java-based SDK. It used to be strictly linked to the OpenJDK. However, Google is working their way into their own framework. It's still Java-like, but you typically need to have an Android SDK. You also have browser apps. However, these are slowly going away as the browsers essentially start locking down and become more secure. They're starting to turn off their app stores. Just read an article today, actually, that I think December 31st or January 10th, Google will be dropping their Google app feature from the Google Chrome browser. So their app store is actually going away. Firefox, with their last release, actually disabled most of their plugins and extensions, so most of their apps have gone away as well. So you actually build an app for a browser, you're probably going to actually be building a website of some functionality. Other particular devices, over in Asia, you've got Zen, which is Samsung trying to build their own OS for their phone so that they can kind of get away from Android. However, that seems to not have taken on as much as they had hoped. It's big in you know Asia and China, but it has not taken on at all here in the U.S. BlackBerry, the devices are still there. There are still some older devices, but uh, most of them are no longer using RIM. They're now using some form of Android, and there's other particular devices that are on the market using other languages that are not listed. Taking a development platform. So we can go with the standards. We have with iOS, you have to use Xcode or Objective-C or Swift. If you're going to use Android, you have to use Java or the Google equivalent, which is a form of uh, like Ruby, and I think they even have a Ruby plugin for it now. If you're doing Windows, of course, it has to be Windows, C Sharp, and then all your other flavors. But if you don't want to pick one particular device and you want to actually create a mobile app that will work on many different devices, these are kind of the top five, I would say, that you would want to start looking at. My personal favorite is Accelerator. For a single license, uh, it is free. They have some cloud features. They've got analytics and things you can do there. It is essentially a straight-up MVC framework concept, which uses XML, JavaScript, and their form of CSS, which is called TSS. But it's basically a CSS library built on the Accelerator library. Very close to true CSS, but it has some additional properties that don't exist in actual CSS. PhoneGap uses PHP. So if you're a PHP user, PhoneGap may be what you want to use. Xamarin, for those that like C-sharp. Senta Touch, uh, HTML5. Uh, I kind of like Senta Touch. The only problem I have with them is you have to pay for an initial license. So even if you want to get started, you have to pay out the gate. It is cheap. It's like $4 a month. But still, if I want to learn to see if it's going to be something that will work for me, I'd like to have at least some way of demoing it or you know, trying it before buying it. It's on the list because it is becoming popular. It's just my, one of my personals, yeah. The last one I've used on and off, uh, the Oracle Mobile Application Framework is built into the Oracle Java Developer or J Developer. I believe they now even have a plugin for NetBeans, but it uses uh, Java, HTML, and JavaScript to build the mobile application. Now, what all these have in common is they all are written in their specific languages, but they deploy to multiple devices. So Accelerator currently supports iOS, iPad, Windows, and Android. The mobile web is currently been de deprecated because of the browsers essentially turning it off. PhoneGap, I think, is iOS and Android. It may or may not be Windows. Xamarin, I believe, is all of them as well. Sense of Touch, I think, is iOS and Android and Oracle uh, mobile application framework is all the above. So why do I like to use App Accelerator? Well, essentially these are the highlights. It comes with analytics, API, it's got cloud-based tools you can purchase. You can actually build your cloud within them. You don't have to go create your own. So if you're not really savvy uh, with the cloud, you can use all their tools and APIs pre-built for you. Real easy, real cookie cutter out of the box stuff. Or you can do your own. It's very open, it's very configurable, you can pretty much do what you want. To me though, the biggest selling feature of this is 
you develop using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You don't need to hire very expensive Java or C Sharp developers to develop mobile apps. You just need someone that can build web pages. Well, web pages very well. Requirements to build apps in Accelerator. Well, if you want to build iOS, you're going to need to have a Mac. Xcode, which contains all the iOS SDKs, only comes with a Mac. Uh, you can try to port them over to Windows or Linux. It kind of works, but you can't test them real well. So if you're dealing with iOS or building an Apple app, you're going to have to have some type of Mac device in order to develop a Mac application. Same goes with Windows. If you want to develop a Windows app, you have to have Windows. The nice feature here, though, is if you're on Windows, it's easier to install VirtualBox or some other virtual OS container and run Windows. I've tried to do it in reverse. I've tried to load the Mac OS in a VM on Windows. It's buggy. It works. But unless you really have super hardware to push it, it's very flaky. So. My recommendation is if you want to build mobile devices for multiple devices and Windows and Mac, do it from a Mac and install some Windows VM. As far as Android and mobile, you can develop those on any of the applications, Linux, Windows, and Mac. So let's go out and build our first application in uh, Accelerator. So here is Accelerator. So if you go to accelerator.com, sign up. Uh, you can sign up for a free account. They'll send you an email. You click the email, then you log in. Once you're logged in, you have your portal here. So the first thing you want to do is click the Get Started uh, guide here to install the App Builder. And once you download it, install it, you then get an Eclipse build with App Accelerator installed. And the first thing you want to do is check out what you have installed. So I've already got the Android SDK installed locally. So it says, hey, you're good to go. Android's installed. Mobile web is installed, but like I said, it is being deprecated because browsers are going away. So yes, it's installed, but it's not real easy to deploy to these apps anymore since most of your browsers won't open it up or won't run these apps. iOS and Xcode, hey, this works because I'm on an Apple machine. However, Windows won't. I need to be on a PC. So if I loaded this on a Windows OS, you would see Windows Android Mobile, but you would not see iOS Xcode. And if you were on Linux, you would see only Android and mobile web. All right, so the first thing you want to do is create a new project. So we're going to create a default Alloy project. You can still do the old classics. These are kind of interesting if you want to get in and really give yourself a migraine. But it is cool to go around with these because you actually have to build the components that Alloy does for you out of the box. Classic was great when it first came out, but people got tired of rebuilding the same button or building button classes and basically reinventing the wheel every time is not fun. So Alloy created a whole bunch of libraries for you to use out of the box and they're XML. So they're essentially just XML tags. So we click next. We're going to give it a project name. This will be our product analog and we need a app ID. This is pretty standard for iOS, Android, Windows. So essentially what you're putting in here is the minimal information you're going to need for building the projects for any of the mobile devices. So we're going to do the reverse uh, URL. So com.develpreneur. And we're going to do this one as catalogs. So this will be the identifying app ID in the app stores once we publish it. And then our personal or company address. So this will be the correct URL. Again, that will show up uh, with the App Store, or when you publish it, it'll recognize who you are with the company. Since this is a demo, we don't need the Accelerator platform services. I don't want to actually turn that on and get charged. And again, you can do mobile web, but as you can see here, it is deprecated. Uh, since I have an old Android project locally, I won't be able to run Android, but you can still enable it for Android. Click Finished. We're building our app. Take just a second because you've got to download a, a few dependencies. And boom, we now have an app. And as you can see by default, it opens up the TI app editor. This is an XML file at the base of your project. This contains all the project settings, any third party modules. If you have an Apple Watch app, 
plug in, you'll need to load it here. But this is a nice graphical view of the actual settings, which are right here. Scroll down to the deployment targets, Android, iPad, iPhone. If I want to use any of the platform services, I set them up here. You'll have to log in to set up your cloud. And then the very next thing we're going to do is we're going to run this. Let's make sure we get it to run. It's going to display Hello World. So we come up here, we say we want to run it, and we want to pick the App Seller iOS Simulator, and you can choose any of these iOS devices to deploy to. I'm already running 8, so we'll click iPhone 8. You don't have to have the emulator running before you actually start this, but to just speed things up, I decided to leave it running for my previous run so that hopefully this won't take forever to kick off the first time. So what it did behind the scenes is it compiled the project, it created the iOS binaries, and now it's actually deploying it out to the mobile device, invoking Xcode build. So now it's wrapped everything, it's running through the Xcode build to build the actual device files. And as soon as that's done, it should upload the app to our device. And if you watch the screen over here in just a minute, you will see an app pop up and install. There it is, launching the simulator, which is already there. And now it's installing our catalog and running the catalog. And all we have so far is hello world. So our app is deployed and running. Now what's cool about the emulator though, you can click the button and you can actually jump around and fool around with the devices. You can set up the configuration if you want to play with Wi-Fi on, off, location services on, off. Uh, some things that for some more advanced apps you may want to do to make sure that your app will work on different devices, maybe even in different countries if you want to change the location code. All right, so we'll go back into our app. There you go. You got your first Hello World app. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at building out the full catalog. What we're going to do first is we're actually going to look at the project itself. So let's break down the components of our project. So if we had any plugins or any modules that we installed, they would show up in here. By default, you always get Alloy and you'll get all the hooks for Alloy and it's deep clean. So this, by default, is what you get. You need that for an Alloy project. If you had done a classic, it would not have had Alloy and you would have had to install it uh, separately. Default icons, iTunes Connect, these are all the basic files necessary by default for when you create your project, when they get uploaded. These are what will go with it to the App Store. So these are the things you'll have to change here uh, if you actually want to change what uh, goes to either the Play Store or the Apple Store. Platform, iOS. So far, we've only deployed to iOS, so you have iOS. If we had Android, Android would show up under here as well. i18, this is just the generated stuff. All this is pretty much hidden. You will never really see anything in here unless you actually go turn on the filters to see everything. Don't recommend it. It's really a pain in the ass to see it. However, once you build the uh, files for deploy, you can open them up in uh, Xcode or you can open them up in Android or in Visual Studio if you want to go look at the actual individual device code that gets uploaded or, or built for the, the particular device. What we are concerned about is the TI app file if we want to make any configurations. So this is the main guy for setting up your app. Once you set them up, you pretty much never have to go back there again unless you're going to make a change. So where you're going to live for the most of your life in development with Accelerator is going to be under App. So as you can see here, Accelerator is pretty much defined as a model view controller type project. So we have our models, for which will contain our database tables and our database configurations, our controllers, which contain all the JavaScript for our button actions, our page actions, uh, anything we want to do to actually trigger an action on a screen or do something behind the scenes. So this is where we write all the actual code that goes behind our screen. Styles, this is all the CSS code for defining what the page looks like. So it really separates the view and the style layers into two separate folders, uh, which makes it easy to configure your apps. Under views, this is the actual screens. And assets are going to be any particular um, flash screens, images, uh, any additional CSS or plugins you need for mobile web, iPhone, all your images. 
So these are essentially images or any additional files that you need to include, like text files or anything separate that need to go out to specific devices when it gets loaded. However, other than making specific icons and templates and things like that for individual phones, again, you're pretty much going to be living in here for the life of your maintenance of this application. Config JSON is just a config file if you want to set up any additional settings for devices, your environment for testing, uh, you can put in all your different parameters, uh, URLs and things like that for the back end for testing. Alloy.js is your global functions. So if you want to create any global functions or objects, you define them here and they can be used throughout the entire application. So by default, and also with Alloy, you also have the app TSS. This also is the global CSS configuration for all of your pages. Individual pages are going to have their individual index JavaScript for the controllers, TSS for the style, and the view. And models will be whatever you want to name your tables that are going to be within your database. So let's briefly look at what we got. So index.xml, since we're using Alloy, all of our views are going to be wrapped in Alloy, every screen is essentially a window, which is a container. And this here is our container. And on this screen here, we have a label. And all this label said was hello world. Now I can click it and it says, hey, hello world. But wait, there's no code here. My index.js just has my label definition for the size of this label and the font here for the uh, how big to make that font. App TSS has nothing. So the index.js actually is where our do click lives. So any of our action calls, our do clicks, or on click methods, or any of our other uh, actions will actually call a function. So this function can either live in the index.js or in the alloy.js. Uh, what I like about this is it's just like Eclipse. You can hold the command or the control button. You can click the function, and it will take you straight to the function. So you still have that uh, kind of jump through logic uh, within the application. All right, so enough about the overall framework. So let's actually start building our product catalog. Let me go get our source code for our model. So the first thing we want to do is we want to right-click on model and do new. Ally model. There we are. And we're going to call it products. And our adapter, we can do local storage properties or SQL. So we'll just do SQL because this is a SQL like database. Want to add an ID. And string really doesn't exist in SQL. It just gives you, uh, or SQL Lite, it gives you just all the different parameters you can choose. Uh, we're going to do text. And the next one, which will be name, summary, description, and these are all going to be text. And you can cheat. You don't have to do it through the uh, editor or the tool here. You can actually just leave it blank, have it build it, and then you can just go in and actually modify the code. But this is nice. I mean, this makes it nice and clean and simple for those of us that may not like using the code or may not understand the code. If I click OK, boom, built my table. So the first time I run the application, it's going to build a database with a products table. In that products table, we're going to have four columns, ID, name, summary, and description. Right now, this ID is not an actual index ID. So by default, when you run this application, it's going to build a index ID for you behind the scenes. So you don't really have to mess around with it too much. You can keep it very simple, very lightweight, and just kind of go with some of the functionality that gets built for you. And here is where you add any guts or any functionality calls you want to actually add to your product. If you actually wanted to do database calls throughout your entire application and run the risk of accidentally not closing a database connection or not closing a row connection, go for it. This is pretty much, though, your database object for products. So it makes sense for you to actually put all of your logic in here for your database. So I just dropped in a bunch of code here. Let me format that real quick. So I've created a fetch records object. 
which I can then reference from my application. And in here, I pass in a couple things. I can pass in the names of the columns I want to search for and the values. So if I want to select from table and where ID value equals X, so I can actually select table options query. I'll show you how to use this a little bit later. Insert, we can essentially call this insert object here, pass in our columns, our names, and our values, uh, and we can then insert into our database. We don't have to actually create the database connections, close this all the time. All we have to do is just pass in a collection of values into this object, and boom, we can do our simple database calls. So we have insert into, insert or replace, update, delete record, delete all records. So this guy, as it stands right now, you can essentially copy this model multiple times and just change the very top definition for your table. And you now have a pretty straightforward CRUD database interface for your database for use with your application. So we'll save this guy and we'll now come out to our index file. So now let's update our index page to actually be something a little more feasible for what we want to do. So here's our hello world, but here's what we actually want. So we want to be able to use our new product model. So we add a collection for our product table. So what this now does is we now have a reference point to our table. So we can now reference products throughout this page. I can also reference products within the source code, but by doing this here, I define the product as a collection. So now I can actually use the product here as a data collection within my table view. And I don't even have to create a fetch or a get or a select. It's going to automatically map all the products that live in the products table to my table view row. And I can actually map them to different things. So right, right now I have the title, which we'll put it in the list, will be the product name. Uh, I can define this multiple different ways. I can do name plus ID or summary or however I want to do this. The other thing I've done, though, is I've actually mapped the other fields to other values so that I can pass these values along when I want to do something if I click that particular record, which, for example, in this particular case, if I click the row, it's going to call a function called edit product. Right now, that function doesn't exist, which is why we're getting an underscore yellow. And at the bottom of our page, we're going to define a toolbar and add a button to our toolbar for adding a product. So pretty straightforward so far, so we'll save that. Let's add some style to this. So let's go look at our style. So our index uh, style is pretty straightforward. We have the label for the label button, and then we have the label for the individual label that was the label ID that was within our page. So now let's change it. So I'm going to keep the label, but now I'm actually going to add CSS style properties for our table view row. So I'm going to set the font of our text that gets displayed. Uh, in our row at 24, and we're going to set each row at a height of 40. Now we need to add the functionality to add and actually view our product. So if we view our product, so I've added the show product, I go to index, so we have here, we have edit product and add product. So to begin with, I'm going to use show product. So these guys now go away because I've actually added them to uh, the function. So here we are. Out here. So the first thing I did though was I declared a collection bar my products alloy collection products. So now I have defined another variable to point to my database table to access all my objects or all my all the records in my table. Alloy collections products fetch. This essentially refreshes the alloy collections products. Uh, in memory so that now anytime I reference products, I'm always going to get the latest refresh from the table. It's going to give me the late, basically as of that moment, what is in that table. So you don't miss any information that may have been updated between the times you open that collection. All right, so show product. So here we call select, or we create a variable called select product, which gets the event source. What the event source is, is when you click this on click event, it passes in all this information in between here. All your arguments get passed as parameters. So then what you can do is you can actually pull those out. So you define event source, which kind of shortcuts you so you don't have to do event source 
dot product ID dot title dot sum dot description, you can just reference this variable heater and shortcut to the actual values that you want. We're defining a JSON object here called arc, and we're going to set our key value pairs. So we're defining ID, name, summary, description, and product ID, title, sum, and description to correspond to these values. Now, why did I not name these ID summary description in the arguments? Well, there's actually an argument for description and name. So you can, and ID. So you don't want to either name your model column IDs the same names that potentially could be arguments, or you just make your arguments a little bit different and you keep your database or your model the way you want, which is more sufficient where you have ID name summary. So your tables are the way they should be. When you reference them as arguments, you want to make them slightly a little bit different for referencing, just so you don't accidentally overlap with an existing predefined value. We define our args. Then we come in here and we want to open up the product detail page. So when I click the row, or I click on the actual product, I want to see the product details. So here, I'm actually creating a new controller, which is going to open up a view called product detail. Well, right now that won't work because I don't have a product detail anywhere in my application. So right now this guy will fail. The next thing we want to do is we want to take index, which is our home view, our main page, and we want to open a window on top of it called my product detail, which will open up the product detail page. The other one we're going to do is add product. So we have to create an add product controller and a view so that we can actually add our products to our application. And a third one that you'll see after we do the first two is called edit product, which is very similar to show product, with the difference being that the edit product screen is actually going to display the product ID in a label and allow you to make changes to the rest of the fields. All right, so the next thing we're going to do is let's create our product detail. So the first thing we do here is go to controller, right click, new controller, and product detail. Now, the reason I started with controller and not view style or, or viewer style is because if you define a controller, it has to have a style and a view to go with it. So it's automatically going to uh, create all your corresponding uh, components. So we've got our controller here. Our product detail is just going to contain a bunch of labels and a view to display all the information that uh, resides in our product. So we've got ID, name, summary, description, and right now I don't have price or quantity, so we'll just take those out. And it's also got a button at the bottom for deleting the product. Again, we have not declared any of our actions in our product details yet, so this guy is undefined. And let's go check our product TSS. So we have nothing defined here for our labels. So let's Go get our style information to declare our labels. So this again is product details. So there's a couple different things you can do as you build your app. So you have the blank container, which applies to all particular apps and all containers. Or you can predefine the container with brackets and tell it which platform. So it could be platform, iOS, comma, Android, comma, Windows, or just leave it blank if you want it for all. And then we also set the label for all labels we set the font size to 20 or 10. We could actually define individual labels by doing the pound and the ID for the label. Okay, so now we need to also define our product detail at our controller now. So as you can see, all controllers start with ours. This way you can pass things into your pages when they get displayed. So we have our args here, argument zero. Uh, if that's not passed, to handle the null. If it's null or not defined, we essentially define the args as a null JSON or an empty JSON. Console.log, this gives you a way of actually writing out to the little console down here for debugging. Another nice feature about using Accelerator, you can actually left click over past the numbers and create breakpoints and run this in debugger and actually run to the point in your code where you're having a problem and you can look and see what the values are in, in, as any true debugger, any GUI debugger that's out on the market today. Because we're passing in arguments, we, also, we pass in our ID, name, summary, and description. 
So we're actually going to define or map them to the corresponding labels on our screen. So we're going to set the ours ID to the actual label text, name to the name label text, and so on. We're also going to, again, get a singleton reference, not to our book, but to actually our product. And we're going to call it my products, alloy collection dot products. And we also want to add some information to delete our project. So this is where the cool little object that we defined in there. So we've got alloy collections products dot delete record. So I create a little JSON call with query, colon, open and close bracket, squiggly bracket, and then I set my SQL. So I set my where condition. So I can set where it's essentially it's a prepared statement. So I can do ID, comma, name, whatever your where condition is. And your commas are the values that you pass in as your farm. So you essentially would pass in farms, arg, ID, comma, and so on. Close squiggly, close squiggly, close inner parenthesis. So you now have defined your call. It calls the delete record. And if it finds it, it will delete it. And then we refresh our product. So we just essentially do a refresh, a recall to the table to get the latest image from our table. We close, and then we want to close the page that we're on. So we can do product detail dot close. All right, so that's good. So we now have our list page, and we now have a product detail page. So what else is missing? Well, if I go to product detail, this guy should now refresh. Yep, he does. Cool. So if I go back to index, so that covers our show product. However, uh, what about add product? Eh, still don't have that guy. So let's go add add product. There, we have add product. We'll add a controller for add product. In controller, add product. Come down here to our add product to our screen. So our screen is going to reside with X field. So where product detail was just labels, very similar to HTML, an HTML label, you also have a view, and it's a vertical view. You can do a horizontal view as well. But we have text fields. So instead of doing input equals text field through HTML, it's just a straight up XML tag of text field. We then set the ID so that we can uh, pull the values out when we're done. And we can give it hint text so that we don't necessarily have to put labels and waste space. So here, we've just sent ID, name, summary, description. And we've added a button as well, essentially to insert or add the button to the, or add the product to the database. So add product to collection doesn't exist yet. Okay, we'll come back to that. So let's set our text field size. So add products, let's define our text fields. So we're gonna make them border style rounded. There's multiple different border styles you can use. So if you hit dot and control space, these are the different uh, different styles of borders you can use. Again, another kind of like this. All right, so we now have text fields. So we've defined our text fields are going to reside at the top 10, left 20, right 20, and height of 40. You can kind of set their positioning within uh, each of the text fields. Save that guy, we go to add product. So now we need to add some functionality to this. Again, we have our args where we can pass in, but we want to create an add product to catalog. So in here, I have a, a console log, so I can do a little debug to make sure that what I'm writing out is what I'm expecting. Then I'm calling my insert record that we define in our uh, products model. And in here, we have a query. We pass in the columns we want to insert into, and we pass the values. Since inserts really don't have any where conditions, it's just a straight up insert into these columns with these values. So we shortcut having to define the database, open the database and doing all that by predefining this beforehand. Once we insert the record, we call products.trash, refresh our collection, then we close our add product. So if we save this, if I haven't mistyped anything, we should be able to rerun our app. Take a second to load. Goes. And because I am running this in an emulator, it looks a little funky. Some of the lines are missing. So right now, our product list is empty. So let's hit Add Product. 
human ID of one, the name of hat, summary, um, little straw hat, description, um, Head. Now I have a hat. I can now click hat, and there's our details. If I don't like it anymore, I can delete it, and it's now gone. So we now have everything but updates. So we have the ability to pull information, uh, add information, and display information. So if I make one subtle change, so if I add a controller, so the last thing we want to do now is we want to build the edit product. Add one more controller. Call this one edit product. Right here. Create our page. It's going to be very similar to our product detail, or actually our ad product, with one exception. So the only difference between ad product and edit product is our text field input is an input field in ad but in edit, it display only. Reason for that is that's our unique key. That's how we're going to insert, update, or delete records in our table. So here we are displaying the ID, but we are populating the pre-populating the input fields with name, summary, and description so the user can change those. And then they can kick an up, uh, click an update button called save to save their changes. So we'll need to make a slight change to the style so that we can define our labels and our buttons and everything. Text fields, got it. All right, add products, similar to add, we're gonna pull the values in from our table. Only difference is this time we're setting the text of our label and setting the values of our input. Whereas with add, detail, uh, we are pulling the text, or we were setting the text for all the labels. So the edit, we have to actually set the value for our input fields, otherwise the text isn't going to matter. If you just set the text, it won't be displayed. Again, you define your collection, and we have our function here now, update product. Again, we have a little debug to write out what the user inputted. And then we call our update records object reference that we have in our modal. We pass in the columns we want to update. We pass in the values we want to update in those for those columns then pass in the where key or keys and our where value. Call fetch to refresh our collection from the table once our update's done and we close our window. All right, all that's done, all that should work, except we have to make one additional change. So instead of show product, we're just gonna change this to be edit product. So everything's there, I rerun this. It'll be the same application, just this time when we click uh, our item or our product, it's going to give us the ability to edit our product. If I add our product, P1, at the uh, and we got hat, and I don't want a hat, I want a scarf, and I want it to be The color Doctor Who. We now have a scarf. Let's go back in. Everything's changing. So that's it in a nutshell. The only one caveat I have with this that you need to be careful of, pretty much with any of the applications you use to de develop uh, mobile applications, if you are using databases and something happens with your database or you make a change or for some reason it's not refreshing, which happens a lot. Unless you have some way of dropping and refreshing the uh, table every time your app is deployed, which you don't necessarily want because you have to remember, the tables and the databases are meant to be created once the app is installed on the device. It's not meant to delete that database ever again unless you actually physically send a command 
or on an update, you tell it to drop and rebuild the table. That way, anything that is done or collected on the device is stored and maintained in the, the database itself. For that reason, for debugging, it can be a pain in the ass if you've accidentally put something into your database that you don't want. So in order to fix that, you have to actually go to the emulator of choice, go under hardware, erase or reset device, and that will basically wipe the device clean. And next time you reinstall your app, it will rebuild your database. So just something to keep in mind uh, while you're working. So this is all the code that was necessary to build our mobile app. It's actually very small in comparison. I don't think I still have, nope, I don't have the other code still open. Um, but when I did the Hello World for uh, Android, it was about the same, if not more code for just the Hello World than everything we put together for this particular app. So it's very clean, it's very lightweight. Yes, there's a little bit of a learning curve. However, the cool part about that is they actually have a very nice online documentation. So if you go out to docs.accelerator.com, platform latest pound exclamation point slash API, this will take you to the homepage, uh, the alloy getting started, which gives you the entire API, all the documentation you need for AppCelerator. But say you have a question, hey, I need to create a text field or want to know more about text fields. So I can start typing text and field. oh, hey, there it is. I want that one. So then you can go in here. It gives you some really clean documentation, some examples. Oh, you can use a toolbar. So you can then click toolbar and jump around. And it tells you if it's deprecated. Very easy, very clean. I love their documentation. Uh, it really makes it easy to figure something out very quickly so you're not spinning your wheels. Plus, unlike some of the other ones, they kind of keep track of where you've been so you can jump around. You can right click and close the tab, toolbar, close other tabs. So you can kind of clean up your tabs as you go, which is really nice. So let's recap. So we talked about building our use case for building a mobile app. In this particular case, we wanted, or uh, we had a store owner that wanted a mobile device to essentially build their online catalog or take stock of all the items that they have in their store, put them into the application so that later the application can be modified to upload the catalog to the web or to a cloud database that they can use throughout their website or for inventory purposes. Uh, we also looked at what questions you should ask before building an application. We kind of went through the different types of IDEs or builders that you could use to build mobile applications, and we settled on App Accelerator. We walked you through the in and outs of building your first application. We kind of went through the rundown on coding in App Accelerator, and we built our product catalog. Coming soon, though, we will expand on our WordPress plugin from our last lesson to embed our product into our pages and our posts. We're also going to expand on this lesson and build an online API to connect our mobile app to an online database. So the next lesson will probably be on building APIs, putting them and deploying them into the web. And then I'll probably do a follow-up to that one to actually connect our application to the web and go through a lot of the issues that you'll run into having to be online, offline with mobile devices. There's a lot of little caveats there that could easily trip up a new developer building mobile apps. Reporting is still coming. I'm saving that guy for last because once I have all these pieces in place, I want to show you how easy it is for you to build a little unit test to load up your application, test your API, test your databases, and then you can quickly uh, report against them and actually even build a uh, test reporting tool. Finally, we're going to cover additional mobile platforms. Uh, I will probably do some additional lessons on maybe building the same mobile app again using like uh, maybe PhoneGap or Xamarin or even the Oracle's mobile application framework. With that being said, uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, if not, thanks. Send any questions, comments, requests for assistance to info at developer.com or contact us on the site. So I'll open it up for questions at this time. How hard is it or how complicated is it like to convert a functional website into a mobile app? Uh, for instance, let me say, my website like Kusama Consultancy, just in case I want to convert it to a mobile app. Is that very complicated? Uh, so 
convert your WordPress site or convert your marketing site? No, I mean anything, like any website, like for instance, maybe are you in a company and you don't have like a mobile app, like I want that come down and then they was like, okay, oh, we want this function to be a mobile. How hard will that be? Do you have to begin a fresh code or can you transfer that old code and you tweak a few things in there? If you're building a mobile app off of a pre-existing web site, mm -hmm. if the website was originally designed with web APIs in place, mm -hmm. it's not that painful. Essentially, you build, rebuild the GUI, mm -hmm. but all your function calls call the API. They, they oh. call the website to pass the information back and forth. However, uh, and we're starting to run into that where I'm at, they're looking to redesign the whole application, and they're starting to figure out that, yes, we have all these APIs, we have all these web service pieces behind the scenes. They're not all right, they're not all easy to use, and they're not mobile friendly because a lot of them expect very large XML packets or JSON packets, and the way it's being passed in the security, it's not really in tune for mobile app. In fact, some of the applications have to go through certain firewalls, so they have to now either open up a layer of the API outside the firewall that can then have some authentication pieces get into the firewall, so it can get complicated. But that will be probably a later discussion when we get to the API. Okay. Okay. But as far as just building a mobile application, this is a very easy, very straightforward way of doing it. There are tons of examples that are out there. I'm only scratching on Alloy. This is the easiest way to quickly get in and build most basic mobile applications with Accelerator. There are other ways. Uh, there's Arrow. You can actually take the titanium itself and actually build your components. So you, you can fully customize this however you want. You can uh, you could either do it with Alloy very simply, or you can get as elaborate and build custom interfaces and things that you need. That's what I like about Accelerator. It, it basically it gives you the cookie cutter. It gives you the it, it gives you the easy to use plug and play pieces, but it also gives you a sandbox that you can basically do whatever the hell you want.